Greetings, I'm Roger Newbold. Snowed outside today, it's kind of a uh, cardigan kind of day. Welcome to episode 18 of Experienced Photography. We're glad to have you here. My fellow photographer, my partner, and my editor for this episode is Matt Rich. And certainly, he is the man with the magic touch. He's the one that translate all my bits and pieces into the good stuff you see here online each and every episode. So thanks for all the hard work, my friend. <laughs> Where are you hiding today? Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. <laughs> there you are. Excellent. Well, we hope that you have enjoyed there are two on-location shorts that we have produced. These little videos are experimental in our learning process of how to generate location content. And thanks for participating and watching. In our most recent past full-length vlog, we spoke of imaging in an abstract manner. We outlined a number of different methods that you could pursue to add a, a giant sense of variety into your work. We also showed some complete images for encouraging you to well, get out and hope that you could do something new and different and have fun with some new ideas. And that was the challenge to do an abstract self-portrait. Did you give it a try? Today we're going to try another protocol that will add a more liberal touch to your emerging presentations. This one is called the Orton Effect. So let's take a look at figure number one by Matt. It's called Golden Glow. This is a stand of eye-popping beautiful golden aspens. It just makes your heart throb to be basking in their blush. This photograph presents the glowing impression of the Orton effect. The Orton effect is a technique that was developed by Michael Orton in the 1980s and remains one of the most popular post-processing techniques for landscape photographers <laughs> still today. While the fabrication technique has evolved, well, since its first appearance, the core concept remains the same, creating a beautiful dreamlike glow to an image. It can be a very effective way of transporting the viewer into a whole new and different world. Originally, the technique was accomplished using slide film. Ah, film! Photographing from a vantage point secured on a tripod, the first exposure was made totally in focus, but underexposed by about a third of a stop or so. Now, without changing anything in the composition, a second exposure was made, about a third of a stop overexposed, and defocused to some degree. The more out of focus the second exposure was, the greater the glowing diffusion became. The photographer's skill in the amount of defocus was the real art of the procedure. Often a number of differing amounts of out of focus images were made and could be selected later. There are conditions which seem to encourage or promote better results when using the Orton effect. Look for an original scene that is strongly backlit or strongly sidelit. Backlighting seems to augment the radiance of the second image. Strongly lit vegetation or light breaking through the mist are also really dynamic candidates. After the slide film was processed, two satisfactory images were clipped out of the roll 
and were carefully sandwiched together, totally in sync, and mounted just in just one slide mount. When viewed, there was a strong central image with a subtle lighter surrounding dreamlike glow. For good or for bad, the entire image was affected by the technique, applying a pronounced and obvious Orton effect to all of your images is obviously not a recommendation of mine. Instead, you know, I prefer to use a, an effect in a more subtle manner and maybe only even on a selected part of one photograph. And this is where the newer digital version of the Orton effect wins hands down. Now, due to the wonderful comments from my Facebook page about Orton Effect, as I promised, I'm here today to show you how to accomplish uh, an image of six trees in a step-by-step -step Photoshop sequence. The first thing, and I, I really, really want to make this clear, this is how I did it. For all I know, there are a thousand ways to get to the end. Because there always are in Photoshop. There probably is a hundred different image editing tools or software packages that can achieve today's task. And they may be out there. And I repeat, this is how I completed the job. It's not the only way, so feel free to experiment. It is simply just a way. Now, let's look at figure two. We see that I opened a raw image in Photoshop. Raw was selected because it contains vastly more data than a JPEG file. JPEGs are 8-bit files, whereas RAWs are a much larger file. The progression goes from 8-bit, 16, 32, 64, 128, clear up to 256 bits. So, it's easy to calculate that you may have 200 to 1600 percent more quality data that you're able to use in building your image if you use RAW. Now, this image was saved as six trees underscore MG0791. That, that's my camera file number, whatever you have. And then there is an underscore and I put 1A, and this becomes my background image. 1A, that's it. Now, all of this makes data tracking, the progressive flow that's going to be happening, much, much easier. So, uh, MG0791 underscore 1A is the file starting point for an entire construction. I don't do much work in the Adobe Camera Raw or ACR converter because whatever's done there affects every single pixel in the picture. And this, this kind of leaves us uh, floundering back where the Orton effect was when we used slide film. It affected the whole image and it was a take it or leave it situation. Now the tools in Photoshop are very precise and I find that they do a better job for me. In Photoshop I can take advantage of non-destructive layers and the ability to revert back should I change my mind. Yes, 
mind changing is not only allowed, but it's highly encouraged in all creative endeavors. Remember that old guy with the beard? Oh, Ansel Adams. You know, it took him 20 years to decide how to finally print his rendition of Moonrise Hernandez. He tried all different kinds of things. I figure I'm allowed the same privilege. So let's look at figure number three. At this point, I added a new curves layer to brighten up only the background area. Then another layer was added to intensify the saturation of the yellow colors. Now both of these layers remained at 100% opacity. So take a look at figure number four. That file was immediately saved as underscore 2B. Now, we can, if we desire, go back to 1A for safety reasons or change our mind. Once the save action for 2B was complete, I went down to layer and flattened the image that I had just changed by double clicking on background layer. And I changed it from background to layer zero. This is now 2B. Next, I drug layer zero down to create a new layer. And that did a copy layer called layer zero copy. Swiping over the text in the copy layer, I typed in blur layer. So let's go take a look at figure number five. With the blur layer active, notice that little light gray bar over there on the right, I went to filter and the slide down to blur and then slid right to Gaussian. The text box comes up and allows you to select how much blur you would like to add. In this instance, for artistic decision making, I used between 20 and 50. Remember, you can always go back and change your mind. <laughs> and trust me, you probably will. You probably will not get it perfect the first time around and at the first guess. All right, hit OK and go on or go back. I settled on 36 pixel radius, but after hitting OK, I went to opacity and brought the slider down to 68%. Artistically, this was what I was looking for and what I desired. Next, I added a new curves adjustment layer to add a hint of brightness back to the blur. So let's look at figure number six. S figure six shows that curve adjustment applied. Take a glimpse at figure number seven. Once again, I hit the save as and then added three C. With 2B saved in Sitsu, I can always go back and revisit any of the decisions that I've made. Well, oh, great to be safe and have a backup. Figure 7 indicates that three, in 3C, I turned off the visibility of layer 0. Now only the blur layer is visible. This makes any modification to that layer very, very easy. I selected the eraser tool and left it set 
at a feather of about 50 pixels and at, and at the eraser brush opacity, I set it at 25%. Now, with these low numbers, this allows slow, precise work to be cutting through and eliminating some of the blur. As you can see, I removed most of that blur from the six main tree trunks. Now this made them appear sharp in the final image and makes them stand proud as a foreground element. This is where the original Orton effect simply fell short. If you prefer a fractional uh, culmination, this, this is wonderful. Next, I turn layer zero back on, making sure the blur layer was set to a visibility of about 67% for my best in artistic interpretation. Next, I added a text layer for my copyright notice and decreased its opacity to 85%. You know, you don't want it too overwhelming. So see figure number eight. All right. Upon completion of those tasks, I executed another save as and I saved as 4D to the title. In 4D, I added an appropriate new adjustment layer for the black vignette, a 400 pixel feather, and 51% opacity. So take a look at figure number nine and notice that vignette. Once the vignette was added, I felt artistically that the image had lost, you know, a little bit of pizzazz. So please take a look at figure number 10. I added two more adjustment layers, making certain that they are above the blur layer, but below the vignette layer. The first one was a color balance layer just to affect the highlights. I moved the slider to amp up the yellow areas. And then the second layer was a brightness contrast layer that was adjusted to my taste. These two new layers would affect both layer zero and the blur layer where they were only really needed. Only that blur layer really needed this. But by placing the cursor arrow on the layer labeled brightness contrast, hold down the option key, or if you were with a PC, the alt key, and click. A small downward arrow will appear in the adjustment layer only. And this will uh, append this layer only to the layer immediate be immediately below. It's kind of like stapling these two layers together. It doesn't affect anything else, only those two layers. Now take the same action to the color balance layer. This will eradic uh, eradicate any adjustment to layer zero. Save this as 4D underscore final. Now you're done. You have all of your backups. If you need a beautiful, soft, delicate photograph that keeps the essence of the uh, background and a powerful, realistic foreground, this is a way. Now I want you to take a look at figure number 11, this path by Matt. It's a fine example. 
Take a look at figure number 12. It's Summer Morning by Matt. Now I've added figure number 13. It's a graveyard picture in southern Utah that I did. The element or ingredient that provides the diffused softness in the Orton effect is called spherical aberration. If you do not want to use Photoshop to create all of this, there are software packages that may be handy that offer uh, a cheaper, easier, different way. I don't know. There are also offerings that come from Lens Baby. This is my Lens Baby lens. And it adds plenty of character to the images. Take a look at figure number 14. Figure 14 was made using this Lens Baby Velvet 50 millimeter lens. And I used it almost wide open at 2.0. The wide aperture in this particular style lens supplies ample spherical aberration and it mimics the Orton effect if it was applied to an entire full image. There are other soft focus lenses like Imicon or there are soft tar S-O-F-T-A-R filters that work very very well. I have a couple of those. They're really nice. The Softar filters have matched prismatic divots in the glass and the two glass sandwiched together to make one filter and they supply uh, a whole different thing of spherical aberration. Better than a simple diffuser or soft focus filter. They're great. Some photographers prefer to follow what is known as the waterfall approach. This is where the same set of steps is logically followed in every single case until all the boxes are ticked and the project is complete. Now that sounds like a real workout to me and I don't think it's a very creative workflow. In contrast, a creative nonlinear approach that we did today is a workflow that relies on progressive refinement and continuous course corrections. This is where a small set of actions is taken at every single step and then the results are re-examined at every single step and the next iteration is fixed and saved as. This approach has the advantage of being very effective when we don't know everything in advance and we have the freedom to adapt our approach or change our mind as we go. With each step we can get progressively closer until we finally reach our perfect visualization. Now, every time we pick up that little magic box, every time I put that camera in my hand, the possibility of transporting us to captivating locations is increased. It imparts to you a license to create, to create as you please. Now don't worry, don't go tiptoeing about. Come on, just get out there and do it. Well, my friends, time's up today. Matt and I certainly hope 
we've given you a, qu a quantity of new powerful ideas to try out. If this has been of value, give us that big old thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. By all means, let your friends know that we offer experienced advice. You know, everybody can become a better photographer and certainly have more fun. Please keep those comments coming in. This is how this subject got done today. We appreciate them all, and I hope that you found this to be the best vlog that you watched this week. So, until we meet again on screen, a tip of the hat to you, my friends, and cheerio.